Welcome to Colorado, everyone. You can't tell I'm in Colorado, though. That's because I just crossed into the state from Utah on some road in the middle of nowhere. Like if you break down, there's no one to help for a long time, middle of nowhere. But that's okay. Comes with the job. Risking everything so YouTube can see what life is like in the far reaches of our country. This was early July, and I was in Colorado as part of a month-long road trip through the Mountain West. I wound up spending eight days total in Colorado on the trip, and I saw a lot of cool stuff. I ate random things, tried on some new clothes, and talked to a bunch of interesting people. I saw abandoned cities, new growth, homeless camps, and of course, nature. This is Colorado. It's one of the prettiest states we have. Duh. Colorado's a really neat state. And you get to see a lot of it right here on the internet without leaving your couch. So join me as we go through one of America's best states. Kinda. First of all, the elevation, I tell you what. But I hiked up here, it is July 4th, and there's snow. That's snow, and it's July. Most of us don't get to see snow in the summertime. So when I was in a mountain pass somewhere in the Rockies one day, I had to pull over, had to see that. And it tastes like a Rocky Mountain Spring. I saw a lot of really neat stuff in Colorado's mountains when I was here. But before we get to the mountains, let's go back to the beginning of the Colorado trip. We'll come back here later. For now, we're gonna head off to farmland. There it is. That's the border. It was July 2nd and it was hot, people. I had spent a week in Utah, and I was excited to get the hell out of there and see something new. Right now we're on what people call the Western Front. The far western side of Colorado is very desert and ranchy. I spent a couple days on this side of the state. This part of Colorado takes up a third of the state, but only has 10% of the population. There are lots of kind of small podunk towns and farms out here. Neat views though. And by the way, before I get too far, there's a debate on how to say the state's name. Newcomers call it Colorado. Locals call it Colorado. Well, the governor here created a stir when he took a stance. He said, it's Colorado. <laughs> well, I'm not saying it like that because that's wrong. So if you don't like it, too bad. First place I came to was this little place called Mac. It's kind of way out in the middle of farmland near the Utah border. There's about 1,400 people here. It's not really much to look at. Just some nice big yards mixed in with farms and stuff. But it gives you an idea on how these borderline desert ranching communities look like in Colorado. I tried to see what was up at the local livestock auction, but it was closed. That sucks. But wait until you see what I saw at the Montana livestock auction a few weeks later. <laughs> look for that video. Ranching's a big deal here. Colorado's fifth in the country for number of cattle and calves. Lots and lots of hamburgers begin their lives in this part of the state. In case you didn't know, beef cattle is Colorado's number one agricultural commodity. That's a big reason this state's been so conservative for so long. Well, that is until all the California people came out here. 
we'll see that later. Some of these ranches are also open to the public, where you can camp, ride horses, and pretend to be a cattle rancher, even though you really work at a desk job. It's pretty much like this all over the western side of the Rockies. Loma is a teeny place with 1,300 people, also at the base of the Rockies. Homes here are 300K, and some are as low as 125K. Lots of land, huh, everyone? Nice big yards mixed in with farms and stuff. So much wide open, if you can stand the weather. And no bums and no BS that I could see. Just a nice, quiet place to spend a regular life. And it seems like someone on every street has a horse or 50. Hey, horses. They don't care about me, though. That's the Loma Post Office. Kind of looks like a post office you'd see from the old Western Union Wild West days, huh? My final stop on the first day was in Grand Junction. Now this is an actual city. There's close to 70,000 people here now, and it's going up fast. All these people want to live in Colorado now. Grand Junction's the biggest city by far in western Colorado. This is what downtown Grand Junction looks like. Downtown's pretty nice, actually. Their main street's super clean and looks very inviting. The problem is, nothing was open on this Sunday, and there just aren't a lot of options for food anyways. It's kind of dead down here. I was like, what's there to do? Looks like fun, but nothing's open. Since this is Western Colorado, Mexican food's a big deal, which I'm fine with. Who isn't? So we ate at a place called Fiesta Guadalajara. I had a burrito, of course. I forgot to take a picture of it before I ate it. And we watched Mexico play in a soccer game and cheered with the waiters and cooks. They thought that was fun. They gave us some free drinks. Score! Grand Junction's a pretty nice place from what I can see. Just about everything here is up to 400k though for a house. That's kind of a lot, but not really for Colorado. But they have a homeless problem here. <laughs> no surprises. That's Colorado. It wasn't tragic that I could see. There weren't any tent cities or junkies lining the streets. Yet. Every state has its own supermarket chain. Colorado's seems to be city market. Let's go inside. And here's what it looks like inside. Just a regular looking nice little grocery store, I suppose. This is where Colorado people shop. And they sure are stacked up on Coors Light. That's because this state is where Coors's HQ is. At least it's not Bud Light on display, right? In town, we stayed at the Hotel Maverick, which is right on the campus of Colorado Mesa University. And that's a totally nice, quaint, clean little campus. I'd never really heard of it before. I was very impressed. I liked Colorado Mesa University. And what a wonderful sunset at the end of our first day in Colorado. Lovely indeed. Now the next day, it would be a lot more chaotic. It was not peaceful and quiet. <laughs> That's because it was the 4th of July weekend, so there were people everywhere. I think this part of the trip was my favorite day in Colorado. And the day began in more farms, everyone. So a lot of far western Colorado is sort of like a mini California Central Valley. Lots of melons and potatoes and strawberries and lettuce. You may not know it, but Colorado's top 10 in the country for a bunch of different crops. 
I saw more corn here than I thought I would. And I saw hops growing on the side of the highway. I've never seen that before. You may not know it, but Colorado is a big beer state. There's more breweries in Colorado than anywhere else. You sure do love to drink their suds. We popped by a place called DeVry's Produce to talk to them about farming stuff. But guess what? Closed. They had a bunch of rotting gourds outside though. That was interesting. Look at the size of these gourds. Besides the politics and the crime and the cost of living increases here, they got to worry about water. I don't have to tell you there's a big water shortage out west now. Colorado and all the states out west are fighting it out with who's going to get what water and hold on to whatever water they can get. Problem is, they don't know how much water's coming. There's been a big drought here and they keep building all these homes out in the desert. I read somewhere that we've pumped so much groundwater out of the planet, it's tilted itself? Good lord. But I did hear from a local rancher that the local congresswoman, her name's Lauren Bobert, is fighting for water rights here. So that's good. Anyways, yesterday was all about small ranching and cattle communities. And today, it was all about small farming communities, which are very important people. Because you ask people in Colorado, where's the worst places to live in your state? And they'll be like, oh, it's all the places out west, all those little small poor farm towns. People in Colorado say all oh, these little small farm towns are just crummy. So of course I had to show you what Colorado people think is bad. And most of it's just regular hardworking people. The first place I came to is called Delta. There's less than 10,000 people here. Back in the day, it was a very important place for Native American traders since it's by a couple big rivers. Today, a quarter of the population is Hispanic since the place is surrounded by farms. They actually have a much nicer downtown than I thought they would. I mean, this is supposed to be a crummy place. These neighborhoods might not look like much, but homes here are about 350k these days. <laughs> I know, right? No wonder people complain there's an affordability problem in this country. That's like the average price for a house in the whole country. Sucks for people trying to buy a house these days. But I can see why people might knock this area. It's dusty and a little poor, I suppose. But it's quiet, and it seems to be friendly. You can't say that about a lot of this country anymore, can you? When we were in Delta, I popped by a place called the Stockyards. I heard that back in the day, you used to be able to watch them sell livestock from your dinner table while you ate a hamburger. <laughs> kind of sick how they set that up. But they were closed, damn it, again, and I was really sad about that. My kind of place. Then we hit the highway to check out the next Colorado Western Slope town. This is Olathe. It kind of looks like Delta, but without the nice downtown. There's 2,000 people here, and about 40% are Hispanics somehow related to the area farming. Sweet corn is a big deal here. They even throw themselves a sweet corn festival every summer around harvest time. That sounds like fun. It's pretty poor here. I think one in five people here lives below the poverty line. But I'll tell you what, Olathe has some super nice people. I'd rather have this in East LA. I got the scoop on Olathe and Western Colorado from a woman at the local place to get booze. A shop called Coyote Liquors. Well, what's it like in a small town in Colorado like this? Well, it is fantastic. We lived in a big city for 35 years in Salt Lake, and this is perfect. 
We can do our banking in three minutes. We can go to the post office and be done in three minutes. We have a little store downtown, uh, one stoplight, a subway. Uh, yeah, the people are fantastic. We've been here 27 years and we have customers for 27 years coming back to our store. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we love it. What kind of values do people have out in a small town like this? They have really good values and they're here to help. They give you a helping hand. We were robbed two times the first year that we were open and it just about broke us. And so the people all gathered around us and came in and bought and everything and kept our business going. So 27 years later, we're here. Mm -hmm. And you don't have all the big city problems and everything and we, out here. Well, there's problems. Don't, there is problems, okay? There's a lot of drugs, you know, and everything. And of course, a lot of drinking. And then of course, we went through the time of the mask and all that and everything. But we survived and we're still here and we love it. And most people are, uh, it's far, most people are involved in agriculture out yes. here? Yes. So field workers and... The field workers, we have a lot of migrant workers, which are great. We speak both languages, which is good for the people. Uh, yeah, I can switch from one language to the other in a second. So it's good. So you should know Spanish if you're going to live out here. Yeah. It helps. Yes, it does. And it doesn't hurt any place you live. The more languages you know, the better off you are. Yeah. Here's what that little downtown looks like. On the end of Main Street are more signs of agriculture. You see that all over here. Downtown's just nice and sleepy. Just a couple places to get hardware and groceries and stuff. My favorite part was the bakery. It's Hispanic owned, so you have Tapatio and field worker hats for sale. The woman at the liquor store told me I needed to try their Mexican donuts. So I did, and it was what you think it would be. Mm -mm -mm. Mexican donut. She was right. I've got something awesome to share. Big shout out to DraftKings for partnering with me on this video. They're a daily fantasy sports app and it's about to get interesting. So I've been getting into basketball a lot more lately and there's nothing like the adrenaline rush of making your own team roster picks. Right now, new customers can play for free for a shot at their share of millions of dollars in total prizes with their first deposit of $5 or more. That's right, new customers can get in on the action now with an initial deposit of just $5. To play, just draft your roster and those players earn points based on their in-game performance. It's like your shot to play coach and predict the outcomes of your team. So you don't just get bragging rights when your predictions are spot on, but there's also cash prizes up for grabs. Now you guys always watch my videos and I tell you how bad Las Vegas is. Well now, you don't have to go to Las Vegas to experience the excitement of sports. Things are heating up on the court right now, and this is the perfect time to join. So download the DraftKings app and use my promo code Nick Johnson. The crown is yours. And back to the video about Colorado. Now my final stop along this stretch of road was a place called Montrose. Now this is pretty much cowboy country, mister. They also have a nice downtown area that looks like deltas. I was actually, again, surprised. I mean, I keep getting all these emails and comments from people about how crummy this part of Colorado is. Is it because it's a lot of regular life living Hispanics? Is that why they say that? I don't get it. Montrose is at the base of the Rockies, and we're about an hour away from some of those fancy ski resorts that you've heard of, Aspen, Telluride. So people have now started calling Montrose their housing relief valve because a lot of the hourly workers that work up in Aspen and some of the resort towns can't afford to live up there. So they live in Montrose now 
and then they drive up the hill to get to their job up at the resort. It's about an hour away. I keep hearing that some small places like this in Colorado are losing their middle class. It's either having to become a place for low earners to live or for the rich people to come and invest in. Here in Montrose, there's about 20,000 people. The place got its start as a major railroad hub in the late 1800s. And hey, look, Nico's Tavern. That's my nickname, but they were closed. You know, I would have went in there. In Montrose, they have this place called the Hanging Tree. Now this is interesting. It goes way back to the Wild West days of Colorado. Back then, everyone was stealing horses and robbing people along the small towns and roads out this way. So a guy named George Bickford, he got caught rustling cattle. So they hung him in this very tree. Damn. Kind of reminds you that we do not throw the book at people who steal these days. And that's a damn shame. I'm not saying we need to hang people. But in most of the western states, they just let you walk into stores and grab whatever you want. You don't have to pay for it anymore. You don't even get in trouble. I miss the old days when people went to jail, damn it. Now we were just outside of Montrose and we still hadn't found anybody to talk to us about farming. All the farms were closed or nobody was around. But then I found this peach and cherry stand along the highway in a gas station parking lot, and I was like, let's talk to them. So we did. Tell me what is going on with the farming world out here. Uh, it's, it's rural Colorado, very conservative area, so it's, it's always interesting to see like the different cultures and like the perspectives of so many different people and things like that. But I think it's, it, it's just really, there's so many different aspects of life out here that it, it's hard to encapsulate just everybody that it's hard to represent everybody and so there's a lot of political tension I feel in the area just because it's you can't really represent everybody very well not to immediately drag into politics or anything but it that's what I see it, for interacting with a lot of people in the western slope it's just mm -hmm. it's hard to uh, picture capture that whole group I guess mm -hmm. um, what, how is farming going? I know there's a water um, it's an issue I hear out west. So the, we, we do have a lot of ongoing water issues, specifically with like water rights. Um, very specifically the Colorado River. Um, it, it's the Colorado River Basin. It'd be like feeding 80% of the water in LA, I think, and stuff like that. Um, our representation here is interesting to say the least. Uh, House of Representatives, we're currently represented by Lauren Boebert, so that's However you feel about that is however you feel about that. Um, but she does vote a lot for conservation of water rights for Colorado, which regardless of how you feel politically is something that I feel like we need in this area because it, it's our water. It really is. We are the ones that generate it, but people downstream, they are somewhat entitled to that water. I haven't really formulated like an exact opinion on it, but I feel like here, the ongoing wash, like water issues that we have, the precedent that should be going forward is that it's our water. It really is. Now, just before I began the climb into the Rockies, I stopped by a real ranch. I wanted to talk to somebody about the way of life out this way. So I met with a guy named Glenn who's a real macho rancher slash farmer dude who's got a big spread on the edge of the hillsides. Look at his property. It's amazing. He farms all of this and he makes saddles and does a bunch of other manly stuff. A total throwback to when Colorado was for real men. And how long have you been making saddles? Since so about 1982 or so. Has the saddle making style changed at all? Styles haven't changed a lot, but uh, there's a lot less need for, you know, saddles. There's there's a lot less ranches. It's not. There's a lot of cowboys still out there doing it for a living in a lot of places. This 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 area just happens to have a few big ranches, so there's, you know, a, a considerable amount of riding still going on and and tack use. So so there's less saddle makers too. 
there is a lot of them out there if you start looking there's guys that are doing it but uh, they're scattered out pretty pretty much across the country and uh, so when you get to a place like this a smaller area there's not very many of them saddle makers or guys that can have the equipment or the knowledge to do it you know to repair attack tear it apart fix it, put it back together yeah i keep hearing we're losing the art the the good artists you know all the craftsmen are are moving on they're dying off we don't have the good old people that know how to do this stuff are you one of the last I, I, breed no i don't think i'm the last of the breed i hope not anyway i think there's just less people that want to work don't want to work this hard for so little money it ain't no get rich quick scheme what do people feel, find is important? What are the what are the values that people hold? Well, I it? think there's still values of, of of old. I guess if you want to call it that, everybody still works for a living and they they work hard. This place has kind of been discovered, so there's a lot more tourism and there's a lot more people moving in that that are retired or something. So there's not much of that, but there's still plenty of work working people. They work hard around here. But yeah, there's a lot of people moving in and there. And maybe some of their, they want to make it what they came from instead of what they came here for. And that upset the people that are here, that kind of stuff. But they want to change it. And it's changed. And isn't, but change is change. The only constant is change. And that's what's going to happen here, too. And it's already happened. So you just need to live with it or, or, or whatever. You know, you can't change that. Mm -hmm. So, But it's all good. A lot of good people still here. And, and people that move here are nice, good people, too. So you're gonna find the other side of the people world anywhere you go, including here. They don't make them like Glenn anymore, and that is too bad. And then we began the long climb up the Rockies and into Colorado mountain town land. I thought this was just really neat. You could still see a lot of snow on top of the Rockies. It was July and it was like 100 degrees, but I still thought that was really neat. I showed you that earlier. I guess the past winter was really wet. They had a bunch of snow and rain, so they were all really excited about that because they've been in a drought here for a long time. As you drive around the Colorado mountains, kind of the first place you come to out this way is a little town called Ure. Now this place is freaking awesome. Here's what it looks like from above. Ure calls itself Colorado's Switzerland, and it is spectacular. But look at this place from the ground level. Ure is an old mining town, gold and silver mostly. I heard that there were more mules than people a long time ago. Back in the early 1900s, they were pulling out tens of millions of dollars of gold a year. Today, it's a tourist trap and just a wonderful looking town. A lot of people come here to mountain bike or hike or get back into the hills on something. And ice climbing is a big deal here too. I hear that crazy people climb up the frozen waterfalls with ice picks. <laughs> Who does that? Ure was very packed since it was the 4th of July weekend. What a wonderful place to spend Independence Day. God bless America. There's less than a thousand people here. It doesn't really make sense for most people to move here, but for the folks who live here, boy, this is real mountain living. I mean, look at those views. But don't look too hard, cause you can't afford it. It's like 700 or 800 K for anything decent. Most stuff's closer to a million bucks at this point. But who knows, maybe one day, right? Look at that. That's a postcard, everyone. From Ure, I took the famous Million Dollar Highway to Silverton. 
It's an hour's drive through some of the prettiest stretch of road I've ever seen. But it's dangerous. There's switchbacks and long, steep cliffs on a lot of the roads, and there aren't even guardrails in a lot of parts. I heard about a tourist bus like that one that went over the side once. That sucks. Some people say this road was built using a million dollars worth of gold and silver. Some people say the road got its name because of the million dollar views. I believe that. I mean, every time you turn another corner, there's another wonderful scene back here. Look at this. I actually ran the battery out of my camera on that little stretch there because I just couldn't stop recording everything I saw. I think my favorite stop in the entire state was Silverton. Now this place has some history. This was also a big mining town. They found gold here in the 1860s, back when the area was still all Native Americans. <laughs> I bet they ran them out fast when they found silver in the mountains, huh? It's kind of a smaller version of Ure, Silverton is. A lot of tourists come here, and most of the visitors that stay here get back into nature. They did a good job of not letting the town just fade away. There's a lot of history here, and they preserved it. So in the summer, it looks like this, but in the winter, I hear it's super dead. Like one bar, maybe, or maybe not open every night, dead. And there's only so many places people can stay for their ski trips. So if you want hustle and bustle, come here in the summer. If you want peace and quiet, come here in the winter. But it's good to see towns that have lost their main purpose find another way to remain vibrant. There's not too many of our former boom towns left in this country. Most of them are ruined by now. And of course they have to have a place to get weed, because Colorado was the first state to make pot legal like 10 years ago. Gotta have that. I saw more than one of those here. Here's what it looks like to live here. It's a little bit cheaper here than Ure, but I bet those trailer parks are worth a million bucks. Well, probably not, but the land is, I'm sure. I mean, I don't care if you live in a trailer, this is amazing. Now when we were here, we walked around and checked things out and then had lunch at a joint called Handlebars. My kind of place, wonderful people. Totally Colorado, like old Colorado, with shot shit on the walls and manly history throughout. For lunch, we got the Rocky Mountain Oysters, also known as cowboy caviar, prairie oysters, or calf fries. They're bull testicles. They don't taste like anything I've ever tasted before. I mean, I've never eaten balls. But if they weren't deep fried, I don't know about this. Did you know eating testes is healthy? That's nuts, Mappy. I don't care how healthy they are. I'm never eating those again. One place in Montana has a whole event for eating mammal gonads. That's nuts. I wish I knew about that. Sounds like a real ball. After Silverton, we wound up in Durango for two days. There's a whole video just on Durango. We saw a 4th of July parade and marveled at just how much their downtown's changed. It's getting pretty bougie these days. and Locals aren't happy about that. It has probably quadrupled in size, which you know, it's okay in a sense. Unfortunately, a lot of these people that are coming here are coming here to change it. And that's not why I came here. I came here to enjoy the beauty 
of this wonderful place we live in, and now it's overrun by a bunch of Californians and Texans. I also saw a really lousy 4th of July drone show. It was terrible. Fighter danger or whatever, so they did drones instead of fireworks. Not worth it. Howdy! Hey. How's everybody doing this evening? On my second night, I went to a real chuck wagon on the outskirts of town to a place called Bar D Ranch. Oh yeah, this place is legit. They give you your food on plates and a line and everything. The food was really good. And then they had some old timey band come up and play some tunes that only people over 70 really seem to enjoy. My last stop before I left Durango was a fun place called the Nugget Mountain Bar. It's one of many places you can go to at the base of Durango's Purgatory Ski Resort. Now, a lot of people haven't heard of Purgatory. Look at the map, though. <laughs> this is considered a small ski resort for Colorado. But for most states, this would be massive. For Florida, it would be unprecedented. And then off we go. This was my fifth day in Colorado. And on this stretch, we drove through the mountains from Durango to Pueblo. Most of the drive was just small little mountain towns. Not as impressive as the million dollar highway towns or anything, but still pretty neat. And there's also lots of small, poor Hispanic communities in Southern Colorado, just like there are on the Western Slope. We'll see some of that too. At the beginning of the day, I became fascinated with prairie dogs. I hadn't really seen them before. By the end of the month long trip, I was kind of over it. But when you see your first prairie dog, it's unforgettable. We pulled over to take a peek at some and somebody got mad. Probably just because we had California plates on the rental. Come on, lady. Just trying to look at nature. I don't have this where I live. If you want to come to the beach and look at fish, I won't honk at you. <laughs> Further down the highway, I got my first taste of the gun culture here in Colorado. This part of Colorado loves their guns. There was an outdoor shooting range I came across on the side of the highway. I was like, I don't think I've seen a shooting range right by a freeway. Good, I just want to see somebody shoot something. Southern Colorado seems way more ranchy than farmy. To make that point, I stopped at a horse training facility outside of the small town of Pagosa Springs. The owner of the place was up on a slope running hooves, but she told me I could stand outside the gate and take it all in and get video. Thanks, Pirelli horse riding school lady. Now I had heard of Pagosa Springs, but I didn't know it was such a cool little gem somewhere in no man's land, Colorado. Check this place out. Downtown was pretty hopping. I mean, it's July and it's a tourist magnet, but there's a lot more to Pagosa Springs than I thought there'd be. It totally passes the Nick Johnson test of small town wonderful. I think you should consider it. <laughs> people in Pagosa are like, stupid YouTuber, shut the hell up. We don't need any more people here. LOL emoji. The town got its name because of a nearby system of hot springs. You may not know it, but the world's deepest geothermal hot spring is here. I didn't see it. Sorry to burst your bubble. I hear it's really hot though, and people get burned all the time. And look at these neighborhoods. 
this little town past the half million dollar mark for houses now. And it's just going to go up, up, up. Everybody wants to be here. They're not going to be able to afford it one day. It's kind of small here. There's less than 2,000 people. But a lot of people are discovering Pagosa Springs. And it's growing. I hear that at this point, more than half the houses are owned by out-of-state investors. And they're freaking out about this in Pagosa Springs. So they're trying to cap the number of Airbnbs allowed at 5% of the total house volume to prevent the town from losing itself. We'll see how that goes. But I can see why people want to be here, though. Then we headed up the mountains again. One thing I noticed on this mountain drive was all the dead pine trees. I think those are some sort of pine trees. But was this from the drought I hear is messing up everything out here? I don't know. But it was pretty bad in spots. I didn't know if the trees were dead from drought or bark beetles or what. In between mountain tops, we came across a little town called South Fork. Population 500. This place was a big deal for timber production a long time ago. It's very conservative here. But a few years ago, the town went down and shut down a BLM tent at the local farmer's market. My God, I can bet that whole ordeal was controversial, right? Here's what it looks like to live in a Colorado mountain valley town about an hour from New Mexico. It's only four or five hundred K to buy a home here. Not too bad for Colorado. Looks nice to me. I bet the bears walk right into your living room. We passed a lot of small Colorado towns in southern no man's land. This is Little Del Norte, population 1500. This was a mining town that's now big on agriculture and ranching. It's pretty poor here. And the population's going down, which is very rare for Colorado, a place where the population is not growing. And it's only a quarter million bucks for a house here. So get in on that, people. And just outside of town, I saw this Trump-themed storage bin. I'm telling you, a lot of Colorado is still conservative, except for the Front Range near Denver. And down the road is Little Alamosa. It's also a farming community. And this, too, gets a bad rap from Coloradans who look down upon somewhat poor Hispanic farming towns. People say, Alamos is bad. I get it, it's kind of poor, whatever. Sure is cheap here. There's homes on this street that are as low as 25K. Now, I'd say that's a deal, but I don't know if you'd actually enjoy living way out here. And I don't know if you can buy it as an investment and then Airbnb it. Because I don't know who's going to Airbnb in Alamosa. Just saying. I didn't know about this. Check this out. So we were driving through town and we came across the Rio Grande River. I was like, I didn't know this was way up here. It actually begins not too far from Alamosa. And then it runs south through New Mexico and creates the border between Texas and Mexico. I don't think there's any illegals this far north on that river, though. That would be a racket. There's one Mexican place. There's another one. How do you decide? Every corner. And of course, I had to get me some Mexican food in Alamosa. Couldn't leave small town Colorado without trying their Mexican food, could I? And would you look at that? There is nothing like some street tacos on a nice summer day in rural Colorado. That made my day, I tell you. Further down the road, it turns back to desert all over again. 
And then we came to the small town of Blanca. Say it with me. Another little Hispanic community in the middle of farmland. I think there's 300 people here. And four Mexican restaurants. I counted. Little Blanca looks like somewhere you'd find in Mexico. To me, anyways. But wonderful views all over here. It was actually pretty cool on this day. We'd been in the 90s on the western slope, but today we barely got in the 70s. And it was a welcome relief, I tell ya. And then at the end of the day, we finally came to Little Walsenburg. Everybody in Colorado told me I needed to see Walsenburg. They're like, it's really bad there. It's totally the kind of place you like to go to, Nick. It's all run down and beat up and dangerous and sketchy. And I kind of have to agree. This was bad. There was vacant stuff all over. It kind of looked pretty rough. Walsenburg was a big deal in coal mining a long time ago. But after all that ended, the population's plummeted. There's about 3,000 people in Walsenburg now. That's about half as many as there were in 1940. I think two-thirds of the population's Hispanic. Again, one of the few places I've seen in Colorado where the population's going down. Look at all the houses that sold here for less than $100,000. That's like the whole town. I hear they're trying to rebuild the economy here with weed. Like, it's cheap there, and there's nothing else going on, so let's grow some pot there, put in some big warehouses. I don't know if that's going to ever get going or not, but they talked about it. So we spent a couple days in Pueblo when we were here. Pueblo was okay. Downtown wasn't bad. But I have to say, a lot of Pueblo's pretty run down and poor. And it's also the most dangerous place to live in Colorado. But they have a nice river walk. It's totally not the worst place I've ever been. It was here in Pueblo where I visited a dispensary for the first and only time on the trip. Weed is legal in Colorado. And you sure know it when you're in Pueblo. I think there's 20 or 50 dispensaries here. But drugs are bad, bad, bad. Don't do them. I only went in the dispensary just to see what it looked like. And maybe bought a candy bar for research. That's it. <laughs> now this was the part on the trip when I had to get four new tires on my car rental. Yeah, I talked about it in another video. But basically, the Fox rent-a-car I picked up in Salt Lake City had tires that fell apart only about 500 miles into the trip. I was like, what in the hell is going on here? <laughs> Check out what they look like. The tire guy in Pueblo was like, who sent you on a month-long trip in a rental with tires like this? I was like, Fox rent-a-car did. He put four new tires on the rental for only 300 bucks, which is the deal of the century, my god. And then we were ready to go. The last four days in Colorado were basically front range sprawl. It's everything along I-25 from Pueblo up to Fort Collins. And Denver's right in the middle. This is where all the new people from California have moved. It's overpriced and expensive, but still very nice. Locals call this the crummiest part of Colorado. Long-timers hate all of this. Not good. Not fun. I made some stops along the way for you people. There's some interesting out this way. Woo -wee! As soon as we left Pueblo, we came across the old I-25 Speedway. It was a place where they used to race cars. Today it's closed. It's still a sign that there's still some redneck left in Colorado. But less and less every day. A sad state of affairs that is. 
Colorado Springs is about an hour south of Denver along this stretch. From what I hear, this used to be much nicer, but you know, Americans have a way of ruining everything. Today it's becoming overpriced and filled with bums. I went out of my way to locate one of the tent cities that's made its way to this part of Colorado land. I'm sure Colorado people think, this is a debacle. It's not that bad compared to real debacles I've seen. Conversely, downtown Springs is quite lovely. There's almost half a million people here now, and it's going up all the time. They say by 2050, Colorado Springs will have more people than Denver, if you can believe it. I know, right? This whole area has been very conservative. Part of that's because the Air Force has a big presence here. But that's changing. No other metro area in the country saw a bigger shift from red to blue during the 2020 election than right here in Colorado Springs. If you want to live here, it's going to cost you over a half million smackers. Because everybody wants to be here, and there's a lot of room. And while we were in Springs, we had to check out the PRCA Hall of Fame and HQ. The PRCA is the biggest rodeo league in the world. All the big cowboys from all over the country get together and compete, and it's a really big deal. It goes back to 1979. Every young buck who wants to win a big gold buckle dreams that one day he or she will compete in the PRCA. So we spent two days in Denver. Most of Denver is very nice and it's growing and there's all kinds of energy and good jobs. But longtime Denver people are pissed off about all of this. There's a huge homeless problem in Denver now and it's just getting worse every day. Sucks for them. I also spent an evening at Red Rocks, everyone. If you don't know what Red Rocks is, it's kind of a big deal in the music world. It's kind of basically the most famous intimate venue in the world or whatever. They built an amphitheater way out in the desert inside of these rock formations. Totally neat. Great place to watch a concert. Somebody offered me mushrooms in the parking lot before the event, which I declined because drugs are bad, kids. And I'm glad I didn't drink very much because the stairs up and down this joint are intense. On stage was the Avid Brothers. I had no idea so many people were into these guys. Most people stood the entire three hours. I did not. Not my thing. So sometimes the weather at Red Rocks can turn pretty quickly. At the beginning of the show, the weather was wonderful. And everyone was like, yay, it's not raining. Last night it rained. This is great. And then out of nowhere, this big cloud came in and we all thought we were going to get drenched. I guess we got lucky, but it was still pretty windy and scary. And finally, the final stretch of Colorado that I'm going to show you. We took I-25 from Denver up to the Wyoming border. It takes about an hour and a half. Now, I like the northern Denver burbs way more than the south side. It's a lot more wide open and chill up here, and there's not as much development. It doesn't feel so much like California up here. Yet... But there's still a lot of farms up here that are framed by the snow-capped Rockies. What a sight, people. What a sight. The first stop was Longmont. I really liked it here. It's less than an hour north of Denver, so a lot of people live up here and commute down there. But it still has this small town vibe thing kind of going on. There's almost 100,000 people here now, so it has the potential to get too big. 
I don't think it's going to be small town vibe for too much longer. This downtown was nearly dead in the 80s, but there's been a lot of new planning and investment here since then. Now a lot of people are streaming in. There's some tech here now, and this town is sort of a jumping off point for tourists who want to go into the Rocky Mountain National Park. But it seems like more and more there's housing developments going up all over up here. You can't blame people for wanting to live here. Colorado has a lot of sun and a good economy and, well, the weed, I guess. But these homes outside of town are nice looking, aren't they? And then up the road is Loveland, Colorado, which is also a gem. I like Loveland a lot. Their downtown's really cool. It's bustling and clean. I didn't see any riffraff or any bums. But this place is getting just about as many new people coming in as everywhere else in the Denver area. They're also on track to get to more than 100,000 people one day. Loveland was a big railroad hub in the 1800s and then they switched over to being important in agriculture. You may not know it, but at one point back in the day, Loveland had the biggest cherry grove in the western USA. But then Michigan started growing cherries, and all of Loveland's cherry trees froze one year, so that went away. That sucks. But you can still get a good cut of meat in town. The rear of the steer! Now that's a great name for a steakhouse. Hi huh, everyone. So we were just driving around Loveland and a woman waved. I think she knew who I was and she was like, Hey, so we stopped to talk to her. She has a business downtown. She gave us a scoop on Loveland. It's an artsy town. We're actually an art Mecca now. So we're on the map of artists world renowned. So that's fun. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are there a lot of people moving up here fleeing Denver sprawl? Um, yeah, we get a lot of out-of-staters coming to Colorado. I mean, we, we've grown so much. The whole front range, you mm -hmm. can tell the beauty of it, attracts the people. Are people worried that this front range is going to be ruined by people one day? I thought day? that in the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, it is what you make it, you know. Yeah. The prices are gone crazy, like everywhere, I'm sure. Like what, what did it go from and what is it now for like uh, a house? The first house I bought in 1989, $30,000, three bedroom, one bath, just a little bungalow. That same house would probably go for close to 400 now. In, Lo in Loveland? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, it's gone up a lot. What, what, what's it like to live out here? You're, you're not in the sprawl of Denver. You're kind of halfway to Wyoming. Loveland is, is like... Denver will get a foot of snow, Loveland won't get any. It's like we're almost protected by the mountains. But, um, I mean, we have our problems. We've had floods, we've had fires, we've had, you know. So, and we get four equal seasons, which is great. Mm -hmm. So it's fun. It seems quiet and peaceful and not, like, I'm sure. Well, the town itself is sprawled out. Like, it's more towards the highway now. So this downtown is... It has its changes, but it's, it's really doing great now. Yeah, because of the art world and mm -hmm. the little breweries and things like that. And finally, the last stop in Colorado before you get to Wyoming is Fort Collins, which I liked a lot. Now, some people told me I missed all the homeless camps and the trashy areas here, but from what I saw, Fort Collins was really nice. They have this really neat little downtown Main Street where everybody was hanging out. It's a college town. Colorado State University's here. So that explains why Fort Collins is so nice. Because most college towns are nice. Colorado State's more of an agriculture school. So the kids here are much more level-headed than the woke, rich kids in Boulder. That's where the University of Colorado is. Bum Central over in Boulder. Fort Collins was, well, it was a fort in 1864. 
We needed a place where we could deal with all the Native American drama that was going on down here back then. And then five years later, the university opened up and they had a place to study agriculture. So the area started to grow. Today, there's close to 200,000 people here. And it's the fourth biggest city in Colorado. It's gone up by 20% here in the last 10 years. Just crazy how many people are moving to Colorado. The neighborhoods I saw here were very nice looking, but it's almost 600,000 for a decent house. And that is way up from where it was five years ago. You might wanna hold out if you're thinking about moving here because I think the peak's been reached. Home prices here in Fort Collins were actually down recently. So the housing market here is still way out of line with reality. Before we left Fort Collins, we had to make one more stop. On the Colorado State campus, they have this giant Campbell's soup can. <laughs> Back in 1981, the art school here had a big grand opening for an art exhibit that featured Andy Warhol's work. So they made these big soup cans to draw attention to it. Andy Warhol came out and signed all of them, and there's still one left on campus. And there it is. Colorado is a neat state. It still has a lot of the charm that made it famous. It was recently called the healthiest state and the best state to live in, and it's always been called the sunniest state. But as you can see, this state's going through a lot of change. See it while you can. It ain't gonna remain like this forever. And then we came to the end of our Colorado road. On the morning of July 9th, I stepped into the state of Wyoming for the first time ever. And that was quite an adventure too, I tell ya. I made it. Wow. It goes to Lake Mead or it goes yeah. to Powell. Yeah. They start making more. Yeah, yeah, more yeah. Go away from us and put a call on our water, what they call a call. And they put a call on, on our water. So, you know, water I have here um, is shares of water that came with my property. And if they put a call on our water, I may lose. 40% of my water and they to, to raise my hay to feed my cows. To send down to California. To send it to, to, to Arizona, California. To water golf courses and, and that's shit. that's it. Yeah. They do. They just do. So there's nothing you can do about it. No. Like they'll just cut you off and be like, you get 40% this year, Glenn, and you're like, yeah. I got to deal with it the way I can. Mostly because they <clears throat> they made these, these packs with these other states yeah. to deliver so much water. And then in 20, 10 years of drought, we don't have the water to give them. So do you think the future of farming is in jeopardy? No, not so much. I think, I think it's getting better because farmers are becoming more and more efficient too. You know, they really are grazing more with less. Mm -hmm. it's, they're trying to keep up, but people, a lot of people don't realize where that beef comes from or where that head of lettuce comes from or where that strawberry comes from, you know? So it's uh, they don't, they need an education on that. And a lot of people just don't know it. They think it comes from the grocery store. I heard there's a lot of, uh, a lot of farms have outsourced down to Mexico to save money on labor and <laughs> costs and shit. Is that there, true? There was a, there was a push in California to, to for an example, they hired uh, thousands of head of sheep and goats to eat all the grass under the power lines to prevent wildfires. Good idea. Cheap, easy, doesn't cost anything, and it's organic. <laughs> but then the Californians said, we're gonna vote in a law that says, you are abusing the Mexican population by hiring all those Mexicans and the, out, and the Argentinians that run the goats and the sheep and are sheep herders and goat herders are mostly Mexican, Argentinian, um, Baskal. They say you're you're not treating them right, so they have a minimum wage law now that has to you have to pay those people this much, and they said and the people that own it said we can't afford it, so they don't do that anymore. Oh. 
So we have the big fires from the power lines. Uh, Go figure it out. California politics. Yeah, it's stupid. Are you looking to move and need advice? I do consulting. That's right. I'll sit down and talk about where the next perfect place for you and your family should be. I do it all the time. Together, let's find you a new home that's safe and checks all your boxes. And I can also help you find your new house too. Email me and I'll work with you. I'm not just helping you figure out where to move, but I can help you find your perfect home too. That's right. I know awesome, reliable agents all over the country, and I'd love to connect you to somebody who can help you search for that perfect home. Hey guys, if you learned something new about America or what it's like to live in America, great. You should think about subscribing and turning on your notifications. You can also click one of these videos or playlists for more. This is Sage Nick's manager. This has been a Corner House Entertainment production.